All right, thank you, Kali, for the introduction. So we're circling back to um, <clears throat> volumetric seismic cycling modeling. And what I do in this talk is I'm trying to give you a motivation of why, why should we bother? How should we be up for that challenge? And I also show some initial results focusing on fault geometry and multi-fault interaction um, for seismic cycling with a, a new DG method. And uh, this is working collaboration with Dave who presented more technical details earlier this morning. Carson, who is now at Intel, and James B. Miller was a postdoc at Scripps and is now working um, for USGS and many other people that I acknowledge throughout the talk. <laughs> um, why do we want to model uh, fault geometry? Um, a few examples for um, motivating that. This is a nice work by Andrea Perez, who is, I think, in the audience um, during her master thesis at LMU. She's been using um, a boundary element method called tree BEI, which is now open source, um, co-developed also by Duoli, to model long-term slow slip cycles along the flat, sec uh, flat slab segment of the Guerrero seismic gap in Mexico. And um, this is interesting because it turns out that the specific characteristics of those slow slip cycles, for example, in comparison to the ones in Cascadia, can be linked to the specific geometry um, of the slab in that region. So for example, um, <clears throat> see the um, <clears throat> duration um, moment scaling is quite different to um, the inferred magnitude, uh, magnitude proportional to T to the power of three scaling in other regions worldwide for slow slip events is also still different to the magnitude being proportional to T scaling of earthquakes it falls somewhere in the middle. And it's something that we can reproduce nicely from this model and it's been also reconfirmed by recent um, new SSE catalogs. We can also use these 3D models that account for geometry to do a direct comparison with um, GPS data in that example. And what you see here, always in black and red in these arrows is um, the observation and the model of separate cycle, so separate SSE events modeled in the cycle that correspond, that correspond to observed SSE events throughout um, a decade or so from 2001, 2006, 2009, and 2014. And we find that, as I said before, the flat segment of the Cocos Plate likely aids the relatively large magnitudes and long recurrence intervals of the slow slip events in Guerrero. Now, the story doesn't end here. There was also um, a relatively large megathrust earthquake that was related in time and space to the 2014 um, slow slip event. And Du Li has been looking into trying to better understand the interaction of slow slip events and megathrust earthquake initiation by linking this kind of long-term slow slip cycle models to dynamic rupture uh, models using um, um, offline linked approach <clears throat> to do this kind of um, linking of the methods. And what we find here and what you see in this figure is that the specific um, stresses that are cast by the 2014 event um, are different to the ones that have been cast by the previous events. And um, <clears throat> in this plot, we see kind of cross sections of the traction ratio. So that's the ratio of the effective shear over normal stress um, to our different days of the 2014 SSE event, but also compared to the previous SSE cycles, we can see this relative increase of um, the stressing cause specifically of the 2014 SSE event at um, day 317, which was close to the nucleation of um, the mega thrust earthquake. We, and there was also acceleration of um, slow slip during that episode, but it didn't immediately trigger an earthquake. <clears throat> um, that is also something we can reproduce in 3D models that's quite different to 2D models. And um, if we're doing this kind of linking, we find um, that it is indeed important to analyze not only as single slow sleep event and how it would stress um, um, the fault prior at dynamic rupture earthquake model, but that's important to account for the whole history of slow slip cycles and how they differ um, throughout, for example, a decade of um, SSE observations. When we're modeling the earthquake that has been shadowed by the slow slip cycle, we also see that you know the heterogeneity that is introduced by the slow slip events is not enough to explain the dynamics of the co-seismic slip. So to be able to match what you see here are um, admittedly ill-constrained observations of this earthquake from a um, teleseismic source inversion, <clears throat> for example. Um, and to, but we do see that we have kind of two sharp uh, peaks that appear in the co-seismic moment at release of this earthquake. And to be able to reproduce this, we have to account for asperities that go beyond 
stress heterogeneity that can be explained purely on the SSE cycle model. So there's two things, two um, important factors to that story that is the earthquake, mega thrust earthquake initiation, which can be linked to the long-term SSE cycle and the specific differences in between um, these different episodes, but then also the co-seismic heterogeneity of slip that has, is linked to other terms of um, as parities, for example, on the mega trust. So that's very interesting, but um, it's something that we can capture if we account for geometry and other 3D heterogeneity along the slab. <clears throat> Why would we bother um, including fault interaction? So here's another example of a multi-scale earthquake cascade. And these kind of conversations between slipping faults across scales um, <clears throat> are observed on small scales, for example, um, maybe in the interaction of volumetric seismicity eventually activating um, a large earthquake on the main fault, but they're also observed across time scales. So this example um, is work done um, collaboration of Kadek Palgonadi, Dimitri Garagash, and Martin May. And we are embedding these are um, a main fault into 900 fractures that are <clears throat> varying in size. And all of these surfaces are weight and state friction um, slip surfaces. And they are predefined based on um, fracture network. Um, statistics um, as they are used in exploration geophysics. <clears throat> and what we see here, or what we can do with these kind of models, is not only trying to understand how fracture energy or DC has to or scales with um, slip or with fracture size, but we can also try to understand under which conditions in the seismicity of a fault, for example, in a damage zone, be able to activate a main fault. The animation that is running shows um, a dynamically triggered large earthquake on a main fault, um, which uh, has a delay in its onset where we only see smaller earthquakes happening in the in the damage zone. But if you're changing um, the pre stress a little bit, we can also generate something that I call a little bit provocative here, mode four rupture, that is um, an earthquake that purely lives in the damage zone. So this is a dynamic rupture cascade that is jumping from fracture to fracture in the damage zone without activating a well-oriented main fault. And if you're looking at that from a distance, what you can see here is the apparent uh, beach balls are apparent uh, uh, faulting mechanism. It looks like a strike slip earthquake since these uh, fractures are conjugated in that model. So it's really hard to, to tell that if you don't have um, very near fault observations. These kind of um, conversations of earthquakes or cascading ruptures also happen um, with time delays or across time scales. There's a famous example by now, um, the rich crest sequence and the interaction between uh, the foreshock that happened around 34 hours um, before um, the Ridgecrest main shock. So it was a 6.4 earthquake, the CS Valley um, foreshock, and the M7.1 Ridgecrest earthquake. There's a preprint <clears throat> where we are linking two dynamic rupture models of these events, and both of them have been constrained by the very dense observations we have for both of these events. And we also show that the um, dynamic and stratic stresses that have been transferred by the foreshock on the fault system are crucial to explain the dynamics of the main shock. However, they are not sufficient to explain why uh, they're not sufficient to immediately trigger um, the main earthquake. So if you look at this, not in animation, but in a snapshot kind of style, so this would be um, <clears throat> on the uh, left-hand side, you can see snapshots of the conjugate um, dynamic rupture propagation of the foreshock. Um, in the middle panels, you see um, snapshots of um, the main shock rupture evolution, which is kind of tunneling in between a fault intersection governed by the stress shadows dynamic and statically of the foreshock. But you can also see on the right-hand side in um, the snapshots of the dynamic stresses and also of the post foreshock um, static Coulomb stresses that um, the main shock hypocentral region that we assume in this model has been brought closer to failure, but it's not enough um, to explain and in the immediate uh, rupture triggering. So there's additional processes here that would require about three megapascal of additional shear stress um, in the main shock hypocentral area to explain um, what's hap what happened. So there's also conversations of earthquakes or conversations of fault slip, not only across spatial scales, but also across time scales. <laughs> so why would we bother using HPC? Um, one of the main reasons is that using more complex models, using 3D models and um, utilizing high performance computing infrastructure allows us to investigate data driven and physics based models. So we can bring together what we know about the physics and these interesting physics based models with observations that are available. Um, another example here is um, matching 
strong ground motion seismograms of the Amatrice Italy earthquake um, <clears throat> up to five hertz, the high frequency range using um, dynamic rupture scenarios, the rough faults and topography. And um, the interesting part is that we constrained a slip model based on a dynamic source inversion. That means we're using an um, abation approach to use seismograms to not invert for a slip pattern or image a slip on a fault, but to invert for um, the rate and state friction or the slip uh, linear slip weakening uh, rupture parameters at every point of the fault. This is computational tractable for um, frequencies up to one hertz, which yields a relatively smooth source model, um, which is illustrated here. But we can um, enhance this, for example, by including fault roughness and with other ideas that we have about heterogeneity governing um, high frequency ground motion radiation to push this all the way up to five hertz um, matching um, <clears throat> observations that we have available. And what you see here is a smoothed acceleration um, Fourier amplitude spectrum um, of a reference smooth model in gray and um, <clears throat> the observation is in black. And if we're adding um, fault roughness, we can see some improvement of the high frequencies that are generated. If we're adding topography, which is something we didn't discuss yet in, in, um, throughout um, the sessions, I think, we're also um, generating realistic um, coda signals in, um, in our synthetic ground motions. <clears throat> okay, so we heard a lot about boundary and volumetric methods for seismic cycle simulations, and there's a detailed overview that we've been putting together that is online on YouTube. But in short, in a nutshell, um, boundary methods are typically um, lower dimensional, they're fast, but they do require a fundamental solution, which is mostly um, analytical Green's functions and are thus somewhat restricted in terms of um, off-fault materials and also fault interaction. Volumetric methods doesn't have to be DG, could be finite difference or finite um, volume or spectral element methods have to discretize the volume, a higher dimensional computationally more demanding, but should be more universally applicable, including heterogeneous or nonlinear off materials and many faults that interact with each other. One interesting aspect, and uh, this really thanks to a very active and successful community verification efforts of both kinds of codes is that there are benchmarks around that compare both of these methods and show that they agree for simple setups. So here's just one example. This is from uh, Jun Lee's paper and JTR, where you see how well these very, very different um, approximations of the same problem can agree for um, community benchmark setups. <laughs> However, we need open source community methods and we also need um, utilization of high performance computing if we're interested in directly comparing to data, for example, or addressing some of the <clears throat> um, problems that I've showed you that we can do in the dynamic rupture community. So Tandem is a, a new open source code that uses a specific flavor of DG that is called um, <clears throat> SIPG. And I referred to the uh, talk of Dave May for all the details about that. Um, just in a nutshell, why we would um, be interested in using this continuous Galerkin. Um, there's four reasons I list here. So first of all, it's geometrically flexible. So it allows using triangles or quadrilaterals in 2D, tetrahedra, hexahedra, and 3D on unstructured meshes. So that means we can use also refinement and coarsening of the mesh to bridge um, spatial scales. The next point is that it's naturally including um, a displacement discontinuity in the function spaces. Um, that means to get our fault into these methods, we do not need to split nodes. And we also do not need to introduce um, the Kronsch multipliers. Um, third point, the polynomial degree of the basis functions can be chosen flexibly. What this means is we can use high order method. Um, and if that works well, it means we um, have to use less computations to get the same accuracy as a low order finite element or finite difference method. And I'll talk about this in a bit, um, under which conditions this works. And lastly, DG methods are provably stable. There's a vast amount of literature um, that is showing that for really a wide range of physical processes, elliptic, parabolic, or hyperbolic um, PDEs. <clears throat> um, and it is scalable. Um, for dynamic rupture problems and for wave propagation problems have been shown that DG can be scaled up to the largest available um, supercomputers worldwide, which is something that our community requires if we're thinking about 3D models and solving order of millions of time steps in seismic cycling um, applications. Okay, two points I want to show specifically for 
seismic cycling problems, so time-dependent problems. And for doing that, again, we're referring to the method of manufactured solutions. So that means we have some analytical um, predefined solution that we can compare different resolution models to, to figure out how well the method behaves. And the first point is high order pays off. So I said DG allows you to use high order um, basis functions. That means we not only have the choice of using smaller and smaller elements to get better accuracy, we also have the choice of using higher order um, basis functions to discretize our solution and get resolution within one of those um, high order elements. So for this, we adopted a manufactured solution um, developed by Brittany and Eric Dunham in 2014, now for 2D and 3D plane strain elasticity with a weight and state fault. And the results I show you use um, explicit runger kutte um, time stepping in tandem with um, adaptive time step control, um, resolving only the quasi dynamic problem. And this plot, what you see is how the error behaves if you're making the mesh size smaller. Um, so the plot <clears throat> um, on the right is kind of the typical behavior that you would expect. You are using higher order basis functions, the error um, decreases faster if you're making your mesh elements sizes smaller. The figure on the right is a bit more interesting because it actually shows you how long you have to wait to get an accurate enough solution. And this basically um, should show you that it does really go quicker if you use higher order um, basis functions. So that's the uh, this light pale pink color is n equals eight. So eight order um, um, basis functions. Um, it shows you that for all of these um, um, uh, mesh sizes, you basically get a quicker solve time in seconds. So that means it's really pays off to use these higher order basis functions instead of just using finer and finer meshes. <clears throat> the second point is also local mesh refinement pays off. So for this purpose, we're looking at solutions of the BP1 benchmark. We will compare four different tandem meshes. Each of them have the same amount of elements, 150,000 elements, but use very different refinements, so very different viability of the um, sampling in space. And uh, this is how they look like. So the first uh, mesh up in the corner is just five kilometer fault resolution, uh, five kilometer um, mesh resolution everywhere on the fault, which is in the upper corner and everywhere in the mesh. The next one has one kilometer um, resolution on the fault and some kind of smoothening. Um, then we go to 100 meter fault resolution and uh, more aggressive um, coarsening away from the fault and um, to 25 meter fault resolution and even more aggressive coarsening. And all of them have the same amount of elements. And as you can show, um, we really approach the reference solution very nicely, even using like this very core, very aggressive coarsening, allowing us to highly densely sample the fault, but you know, um, um, use much larger elements away from the fault where um, we are not as interested um, in a high resolution solution. So that pays off. Now, we've been also doing that um, for um, other benchmarks. So this is a BP3 quasi-dynamic. And this is, again, bringing home the same story that aggressive grid coarsening is permissible. We can match reference solutions of from the boundary um, integral um, model type. Um, and it is permissible to use this kind of very aggressive grid um, refinement. <clears throat> Okay, um, more interesting uh, applications. We're interested in multifold scenarios on um, shallowly dipping um, mega trust or normal faults and uh, curved splay faults. And I'll show you a couple of examples. The first one is a detachment splay um, low angle normal fault system. This is work by uh, James B. Miller. There's um, one paper and one preprint out this year. Interested in how to under better understand how hazardous are um, these low angle um, normal faults. <clears throat> Um, it's just a couple of references of why um, interested in that. Um, James has been specifically looking at the Maui fault in Papua New Guinea. And um, we've been coming up with a rupture models that show that it is dynamically possible to have large earthquakes and low angle normal faults, um, including a perfectly Andersonian extension. So that is um, a long standing fault mechanics questions of how these low angle um, normal faults actually work. Um, interesting for these kind of uh, models is that we have a lot of observations um, from all kind of laboratory and field observations besides a well-recorded large earthquake, which is um, unlikely to happen. But um, we can use models to better understand how hazardous are these faults beyond um, um, the actual seismic record that we have of large events. So these are just some of the um, observations that we can use to constrain uh, models for these kind of um, 
longer reoccurrence uh, potential hazardous earthquakes. Now, if we're adding to these kind of models um, more um, competition, so not only allowing for shallow um, main fault slip, but also adding spray faults or adding off fault damage, we're actually finding some interesting um, dueling um, dynamics of these different um, shallow deformation mechanisms. So we first of all see that shallow coast seismic deformation may be partitioned into spray fault slip or distributed off fault plastic damage, depending on, for example, the sedimentary thickness or the um, orientation of the spray faults. And we also see um, that localized or enhanced um, subsidence can occur depending on how um, this competition dynamically um, <clears throat> goes along. So um, another um, interesting motivation, looking at the same kind of fault geometries and fault interaction, but in a mega truss or in a trust folding um, environment is of course to look into the uh, effect of spray faults on tsunamis. And this is a recent study we have been using long-term geodynamic seismic cycling modeling to inform dynamic rupture models um, and checking <clears throat> what is the effect if display faults are dynamically um, activated on uh, tsunami waves. And we're finding that there's, um, of course, yeah, maybe as expected, quite some interesting effects of um, co-joint rupture of, rupt um, of display faults and uh, mega trust faults on um, specifically tsunami hazard. This is just the motivation here. So if you're doing um, tandem models with that, <clears throat> first of all, maybe with a um, detachment display, low angle normal fault system. Here, the parameters that you're using, pretty simple. And the domain size is 2,000 times 1,000 kilometers, homogeneous material, simple frictional parameter, um, A minus B profiles. Um, the runtime for this kind of simulation in 2D as um, on 120 ranks, <clears throat> as you can see, um, less than a day. And we do use, use here the optional discrete Queen's functions um, being pre-calculated that takes actually longer than the, um, than, the, <clears throat> than the actual simulation. But this is optional and we could also just run through um, the model without that, getting exactly the same results. Um, <clears throat> this uh, kind of simulations have been tested up to 5,000 MPI ranks. It's something I wanted to mention. So this is the result of that um, scenario. And um, you see no earthquake actually happening on um, the main low angle normal fault. A lot of interesting events happening on all of these different splay faults. And uh, we can start interpreting that. But basically, what we see already here is that there's kind of a complex slip evolution and fault interaction. So we have irregular, fast, and slow events occurring on the splay faults, including surface rupture while the main fault creeps at plate rate. We have complex splay fault um, couplings, so they're talking to each other. The shortest and the closest play have more regular um, low slip rate events and a single fast earthquake versus in the immediate plays um, <clears throat> may show some correlation of um, slip slip rate and recurrence rate with the display fault length. The largest play um, goes into regular aseismic transients and seismic events, um, which kind of magnitude appearing to decrease over time, but there's no um, we can think about additional complexity here, especially if we would vary rate and state friction parameters with that, we might um, get into conditions where we also can nucleate um, main fault rupture here. Um, again, this point about the curvilinear geometry being important, this is um, the example of how these models would look like if we use non-curvilinear, so piecewise linear um, meshes or elements that approximate that kind of geometry. And, um, What's illustrated here is that we see um, basically um, um, artifacts appearing. We see the same groups at um, triple junction points, and that is actually a general problem. That's really interesting to discuss also with other um, numerical methods at um, what happens at multiplication junctions. Um, this is a um, work in progress by James, where he's interested in mega trust. Um, settings and varying curve versus planar mega trusts, and then also having them buried or do let them um, intersect with the surface. We have some interesting preliminary results that show that buried faults are fewer events, less total slip, and average slip rate smaller than the loading rate versus the surface breaching. Uh, mega trusts show more events more frequently, more total slip, um, and the average slip rate um, being resembling to the, um, the loading rate. And these are models where um, we're including uh, once play fault, but we want to, of course, go all the way to um, step by step increasing more of those. And here we can already see in this model, so it's a buried main fault and display that is reaching the surface. Um, the display doesn't slip, necessarily slip during large mega thrust earthquakes, 
but it does influence nearby portions of the mega thrust um, co-seismically um, during the seismic cycle here. Okay, um, lastly, um, a little bit of an outlook. So we're interested in extending that to fully dynamic cycle simulations. So the examples I showed you were quasi-dynamic. Um, we are confident that this is possible um, since the bilinear operators that are at the bottom of this method can be actually directly employed um, in fully dynamic schemes. So one example for that is the speed code. So that's an open source um, wave propagation uh, method that's been developed in Milano. Um, there's a nice paper that I highlight here by Mazzieri et al, where they use this for engineering seismology applications, looking at the response of bridges um, and um, city soil interactions, just illustrating again have flexibility in terms of meshing of these methods. Um, the linear servers we developed for the quasi dynamic approach can be readily adapted for implicit time stepping. And that is kind of the, the way we would like to go um, for doing that fully in a fully dynamic manner is to change to an implicit time stepping scheme for the whole um, fully dynamic cycle simulation. The alternative, and that's something we've been exploring uh, by linking to um, the long term geodynamic seismic cycling model is that we could also find ways or develop workflows of how to use quasi-dynamic cycling methods and then just harvest all the developments of the rupture dynamics community without trying to develop everything of that anew into a kind of time step switching scheme in the cycling community, but linking these codes and having um, you know, the rupture dynamics simulations being calculated using a special um, code for doing that. Um, for these kind of uh, ideas, Tandem will be getting support from the European Xi Center of Excellence for Solid Earth um, Applications on Exascale Supercomputers. There's a new uh, phase of that project that starts in January next year, and Tandem is one of the flagship codes, so it joins kind of the kindergarten of codes that will be optimized for um, upcoming um, hardware specifically. <clears throat> um, the other part, or one of the other ideas we are interested in, and that's part of um, a project that we are proposing with Ahmed and um, Yehuda and Zion, it's called the NGS, Next Generation Earthquake Simulators, is trying to make these models more applicable for comparison with observations. And one of the things we would need for that is that we have um, evolving faults um, and or maybe finite thickness faults to better compare to seismicity that is clearly not restricted to fault planes only. And here's just two examples of recent work in our group um, one of them is showing um, co-seismic mesoscale um, <clears throat> shear, shear fractures developing here in, um, in, a, in, a course, in a dynamic rupture simulation that also has a finite fault thickness. And um, some work that we're interested in, and I know Ahmed's group is also interested in that, is trying to um, dig into the face field community and um, use the methods they've been, you, um, they've been developing for crack propagation in our communities to better um, implement um, finite fault um, <clears throat> um, fault slip. And um, this is one example where uh, this work of Nicholas Hayek, who's also in the audience, who's been developing um, a face field based approach for diffuse interface modeling of rupture dynamics implemented in spectral elements. And um, I just showed this one example. So this is a sigmoid fault, a crack propagating along this. And if you're zooming into the stress, <clears throat> we can see all of this um, um, fault uh, zone waves reverberating in the finite um, thickness fault zone, introducing some additional complexity that you wouldn't see on a planar interface. And with this, I end. Um, so we use Tandem here. <clears throat> um, I motivate that with many applications from kind of the dynamic rupture community um, to be able to compare um, seismic cycle kind of simulations better to observations. Um, <clears throat> and it works for volumetric elliptic CS problems, is open source and has been tested initially up to, um, I think, 5,000 ranks on modern HPC infrastructure. We have many ideas how to further optimize that. Um, so this is kind of the, the baseline version um, that um, I showed you the performance numbers for today. Um, we demonstrated high order convergence, and I tried to also convince you that this is actually something useful. Um, I showed you that we can use this for locally refining or coarsening the mesh, which is um, a big advantage in terms of um, time to solution. Um, there's this important point about curvilinear geometry being really useful if you're interested in accurately representing stresses or displacement gradients um, on fault. <clears throat> and um, we do address the high computational demands 
um, of these seismic cycling problems here by using efficient libraries. So this is a PETSI based methods for the G kernels, linear algebra solvers and preconditioner support. We have this optional um, discrete Queens function approach where for simple problems, um, we can um, evaluate them as a pre-processing step, which is easy to do because it's an embarrassingly parallel um, part as was explained in the chat before. And we envision that uh, this is actually useful in problems where there's no analytical Queens function available, um, where we are Think this is actually competitive, um, even in comparison to using a boundary-based method without, you know, analytical Queens functions. And with this, I end. Um, I highlight um, preprint, and um, you can also check out the code on GitHub. And thanks for the attention. <laughs>